Wow, hallelujah, hallelujah. I want to welcome you to this very, very, very special edition of Ministerial Ethics. And um, but we're not going to be looking at um, ethics per se, but still ethics per se. You know, I just walked into my office this afternoon and the Holy Spirit dropped something in my heart. And um, I'm, going to be dis I'm going to be discussing on dealing with pastoral rejection. Dealing with pastoral rejection. You know, this program is mainly for pastors and mainly for leaders. Um, but basically pastors, those that are in the fivefold ministry, those that, are, that have shepherds, those that God has called into, into the ministry. And uh, so we're going to be looking at it and we're going to uh, look at how you can and helping you to handle rejection as a pastor. You know, the truth about it is that a whole lot of people, but let me read a scripture first before uh, uh, I continue. In the book of Jeremiah chapter 3 from 14 and 15, it says, Turn, O backsliding children, said the Lord, for I'm married unto you and I will take you and I will take one, you, one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. Then he says, and I will give you pastors according to my heart. We shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. So the pastoral ministry has started years ago, years ago from the Old Testament until the present time. And, um, but a lot of people do not understand uh, the ministry of, of the pastor and the heart of the pastor. So I, I just want to encourage somebody watching me. You are a pastor. Some, some of you are maybe uh, you just started ministry. And you're experiencing a whole lot of things I'm going to be sharing with you today. Uh, but I want you to, to be strong. I want you to understand. I went for... Uh, my very good friend, uh, Bishop Owa's wife's 60th birthday. And uh, I was opportune to, to say some few words. And when I finished, a lady by the side called me and said, thank you. You know, what you've just spoken today has it's been happening in, in our ministry. And thank you for expressing it. So we're going to be looking at it uh, 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 one after the other. Amen. You know, the pastoral, the pastoral ministry is, is a service to people. You are called to give yourself to people. You are called to serve people. You are called to be a go-between, between God and man. You, are, you hear from God and you relate to the people. You minister to God or God ministers to you. You minister to the people. And um, so when you get involved in this ministry, so many times, especially for young pastors, they just think everything will be smooth. Everybody that comes into their life will be, will be just there forever. Uh, but always it's not the same. You know, most times we, 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 we in our pastoral work, we, we begin to associate with these members or with our members. And in doing that, we begin to have favorites. It's natural that you begin to have favorites, especially people that are, you, you, you seem, or they seem that they are loyal, or they look that they have a zeal to serve, or to zeal to be with you in the ministry. Most times they come to you and they say, you are the best pastor, you are the highest pastor they've known, that they don't know any other pastor, and they make pledges to you. And in those pledges, they say, I will be with you forever. I will be here. I'm not going anywhere. I will serve forever. Most times when I see people talk that way, in my spirit, because of the experience that I have, I say, this will be the first to go. Or oh, that will be the first to go. Because they, they, they come with so much uh, um, promises. And all of a sudden, you, you begin to attach yourself to them. You begin to mentor them. Sometimes in your mind, you are thinking, okay, these will take over from me or this will help me spread the gospel of Jesus Christ 
around the world. So you begin to invest in this one. Sometimes they come to you very young. Sometimes they come to you broken. Sometimes they come to you not even saved. And they get saved in your ministry. Or sometimes they come to you very hot. Hot from where they're coming from. Or family relationships. Or whatever ministry they've come from. And they're very hot. And you begin to pour your lives into their lives. Some come without hope. Absolutely hopeless. And you begin to say, okay, let me pour my spirit. Let me pour my heart into these ones. And you begin to pour your heart into these ones. Then, boom, it happens. It always does happen. But I want to share something with you before I begin to get into what you would do when this kind of rejection comes. So many people don't know we feel rejected. Pastors do feel rejected. Somebody leaves the church. Somebody stops you. Someone that you've poured your heart into just walks away, you know, not even knowing that you have a feeling. So many times when they leave you, they, they tell you we're leaving to this ministry and that ministry. And it brings a lot of rejection. It brings a lot of rejection. And sometimes it is what those that are close to you say. You know, they gang up against you or you hear stories uh, about what they have said concerning you or concerning your ministry. And you feel so hot. You feel so rejected. And you, you feel like just packing in. You just feel like getting angry. You just feel like I can't do this no more. But that's not how it works. That's not how it works. These things would happen. Remember Jesus. Jesus is our perfect example. A whole lot of people walked out on Jesus. A whole lot of people rejected him to the point where the ones he healed, where the ones he fed, the ones he looked after started saying, crucify him, crucify him. If they did that to Jesus, be sure they will do that to you. So before I, I start on how to deal or just teaching you about rejection as a pastor or as a minister, there must be a truth you must know. And God taught me this, well, our ministry will be 17 years. God taught me this as about the 15th, two years into our ministry. So I have been, pre, I have been pastoring the church for, uh, I don't know what year you're watching this, but as of this time, it's for 17 years. And, but I've been in ministry four years before this time. So I've basically been preaching for 21 years as of today. I don't know how long you will be watching this or when, but I think the word of God does not change. You know, this does not change in any which way. And uh, I wish I can make this to a book so that people can read and people can and, and, and leave something behind to the pastors that are coming behind us so that they will know that it is a circle. It's a circle that will always happen, whether you like it or not. That is the nature of it. Okay, we're going to start. I'm going to start by saying this. Please, this is the most important thing I'm about to say in my teaching today. Remember, the topic is dealing with past, uh, pastor's rejection. Dealing with pastor's rejection. When people reject you, when people walk away from you, when people talk about you, when people gang up against you, these are rejections that you face. And these rejections come from mostly the people you love, the people you've invested your life into, the people when they did not have anything, you were there for, for them. People that wanted a loan, you didn't give them a loan, you blessed them. People that you bought cars for, some you bought houses, some you married for them, some you, you dedicated their children. You know, so many, so many, so many, many instances that uh, happens in the life of a pastor. And I'm grateful to God for giving me this opportunity to speak to you as a young man of God or young woman of God or middle class woman of God or even old man or woman of God. Knowledge is, uh, is, is, is golden. Knowledge is power. So let's start. These are the three things you must know the day you walk into ministry. Three things you must realize. People will come to you for three reasons. It is very important. People will come to you for a reason. Sometimes we receive letters from people, pastors. Hey, I want to serve under your ministry. I see what God is doing with you. I want to serve under your ministry. Now, 
the person is already giving you a reason why he's coming. He's coming to your church. He's coming to your ministry. I'm talking about members too. Members say, oh, I watch you on TV and I see what God is doing and I want to be part of this kind of ministry. He already has a reason. He has a solid and the reason is solid. Why? Because it's his reason. It's not your own reason. So people will come to you for a reason. And listen to me. Most times, when people leave you, it is because they have achieved the reason why they came. They have achieved the remember I said for a reason. They have achieved the reason why they came. Some came for impartation. Some came for anointing. Some came because they are sick. Some came because they are going to divorce. So they have a reason. So that reason, we are in the power ministry. And I understand that the people that come to our church, most times 80% of them have issues. Because they see our ministry as a problem-solving ministry. So they come to our ministry. They don't have jobs. They don't have, um, you know, some of them are sick, oppressed, diseased. So they want to be healed. They want to be healed. So that's the reason. So when they are healed, what can you do? They leave. Some don't have jobs. They sit down. They cry every time they're praying and speaking in tongues and praying for three months later they get a job. Three months later, they are gone. Why? They came for a reason. And the reason they've come, they've achieved the reason. So when they come like this and their reason is to get this or get that, some come for a reason where they feel they have a call, they want to be part of the ministry, they want to serve somewhere, and they wait for three months, six months, you are not giving them a position, they leave. That's their reason. Number two, some will come to you for a season. Some will come to you for what? A season. The season is not determined by you. The season is determined by them. <laughs> Hallelujah. They come for a season. The season can be five years. The season can be ten years. The season can be three years. There might, look, at I have camera people here. There might be just somebody that, that comes in here. He loves to do camera. He wants to do camera and he just comes. Oh, I'm good with the camera and he joins the church. And he's doing his camera, doing his camera. He has gained the experience he needs. He's better now in what he's doing. He decides now to start his own business. But in starting his own business, nothing is wrong. But he just leaves the church, goes to another church, and starts his business. So that person's uh, reason and season has ended with you. Now, you need to understand this. When you understand what I'm teaching, it is easier to handle the pressure. It is easier to understand there are people's season. There are people that come to your church. They are young. They are beautiful. They are vibrant. But they come into the presence of God and they get married. Right? They get married. And once they get married, they move. Because the season of being here is they were single. But they are married now, so they have a right to go. Sometimes women marry men and you are still pushing the girl or the woman why are you not coming to our church? No. The woman is married. <laughs> and the husband determines where they will worship. So their season, they'll call you father. But their season, in being with you, maybe they give a lot of tithes. But they're gone. They buy you shoes and shirts. But they're gone. Because their season is over. And when a person's season is over, you know, it has helped me a lot, trust me. It has helped me a lot. Pastors have gone. My best friends, close friends have gone. But for me, I sit down and I continue. Why? Because this person would have just come to you for a reason. You could help him. You could encourage him. You are there for him. You give him a house to stay. You give him a place to live. That's his reason. Or his season has come. And when his season comes, he leaves. Amen? So he comes for a reason for a season, then for a lifetime. There are people that come to you for a lifetime. Those people that come to you, they go past, they go past reason, season into a lifetime. Hear this again? They go past a reason, season, but it's a, it's a graduation. It's a graduation. 
reason, season, a lifetime. Most times, the people that God sent to you for a lifetime, they are not physically present. Some can be physically present. But the people that come to you for a lifetime, they, they don't have a reason, they don't have a season, but their spirit connects to you. So that is the highest level of connection. There's, that even if they, 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 they relocate to somewhere, they still call you father. They still want to come if they are visiting the area. They, they know if they are coming to Camp Timpa, they will come to Christ Ambassador's Church because they cannot afford to go anywhere else. They say, let me go back to my father. Let me go back to my daddy. Now, those ones, they might grow because you expect your children to grow. They might grow and be doing well, but their umbilical cord is still tied to you. Sometimes they will call you and say, hey, Papa, where are you? Hey, I'm sending you a bag of rice. Those are the ones that will say, no, Papa, I'm buying you a car. Or they will say, you understand what I'm saying? So these ones will come to you for a lifetime. And the lifetime people don't forget. The lifetime people can grow. They can grow. And you don't expect your children to remain children forever. There's frustration. But your child that moves to England is still your child, even in the natural. He'll call it, Daddy, how are you? Oh, I'm, I've just seen a girl I want to marry. But it's not there with you. He has grown to a place of independence. So, so many times we must allow people to grow. We must allow them to grow to the place. But their umbilical cord is still tied to you. I see a lot of pastors get into trouble. You know, a man of God was asking me the other day, what are, what are, how many branches do you have? I said, we don't have branches yet. He said, why this? I said, uh, what are the essence of branches? I asked him. I said, my, 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 one of my mentors here, Ray McCauley, is a genius. Ray McCauley, what he does is that he releases, he sends one of his uh, sons to go start the church. They call it Rema Church. Seven years later, he hands over the church to the person that starts it and tells him, do you want to change the name or do you want to remain with the name? But everything about the church belongs to you. He said, why? Because everybody is bound to grow. Every person is bound to be, to have independence. You can't allow somebody to open a branch for you and uh, pastors it for 25 years, 30 years. He's not a man of his own. He wants to be in charge. That's how the life is. So I said, that's how I'm going to model our ministry that will release you. You go and work seven years. We'll say, okay, you take care of the church, take care of the finance. Then you, you have a spirit of ownership instead of um, working for my papa. How long, even the Bible says when a slave works for you, seven years later, you bless them, you release them. That's what the Igbos, Igbos do. That's what the Jews do. So there's expansion. So when Ray, Ray Macaulay has a conference, guess what happens? All his sons gather. And Ajirada I was there, they said they needed to change the ceiling. He had like 50 sons. <laughs> they were giving 100,000, 100,000, each 100,000 each. That's expansion. So you need, you need to realize that and don't get too angry when people are growing. Now, what do you do? What do you do when people leave? When people break your heart? What do you do when people reject you? Number one, you must know that you don't own anyone. Amen? You must realize that you don't own anyone. Everyone owns himself. You are not a God. You don't own anyone. God owns everybody. And because God owns everyone, everyone decides what he wants to do. Number two, they have a right to choice. Amen? Why are you angry that someone left? Is he, is he not his choice? I know this might not sound right. Yes, you've invested. Yes, it is, listen, the reason why you, you worry too much is that you, you, you have the spirit of uh, uh, ownership. You have the spirit of ownership. You don't have the spirit. You don't, you don't have it. God owns everybody. And one of the greatest gifts that God has given to us is choice. 
So a person comes to the church, he served with you for five years, two years, and he decides to go. He chose to come, remember. He chose to come. If he chose to come, he chooses to leave. So why are you beating your head? If the person is leaving because there's a conflict, there's a reason, as a pastor, you must try to resolve it. You must try to say, uh, no, 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 let's resolve this because as a shepherd, you're supposed to look after the sheep. You don't, you give them pasture. If they're, if they're in trouble, you protect them. He leaded me beside the still water. You know, he restored my soul for his name's sake. Even if I walk through the valleys of the shadows of death, I will fear no evil. For thou, my pastor, is with me. So if the person is living because of this and that and that and that and that, you can make overtures to the person and say, no, settle this, let's settle this. Please, somebody was wrong. Someone, then the person can stay. But if the person says, I'm tired, I just need a change, let that person go. Amen. Number three, humans are not bound to you, but they are bound to God. Sometimes you can be preaching and sweating, but somebody sits down somewhere and says, this man is not making sense. <laughs> I know you might not think it is true. We all shout here. Yeah, we shout, we shout. I remember some white women that came, about three of them, you know, that came to our church. And they sat down first week, sat down second week, the third week, they disappeared. And we asked them, they said the noise is too much. <laughs> they said the noise, eh. black people, you know, we like noise. Our sound is loud. The pastor is screaming like he's chasing a rat. Everybody noise everywhere. The white people say, no, let's go back to our church. They do holy, holy. You understand what I'm saying? So people come and they, they are bound to God. They need to go where they will find God. You know, they need to find, you know, sometimes people come to your church and your message you are preaching is lower than them. You might be shocked. People have advanced in the things of God. People are on fire for God. And you come and start teaching them things that are below them. Every day you speak, they stop taking notes. Why? Right? Because whatever you are saying, they know. And they hear that there's Dr. Ida Peter says somewhere. You know? And they walk in the first day, they say, wow, I've never had this before. I've never had this before. I've never... These are new things that are happening to them. And they decide to leave. Because they... Do you know the, gra the, the cow will always migrate to where there's grass? We call it in Nigeria, it's full and it hurts men. They will always migrate. You know, the cows and the goats, when they eat, they don't raise their head. The sheep, they don't raise their head. They put their head like this. And as they are seeing the grass, they are going. They are going. Where, when, the only time they stop is where they have a lot of grass. So when there's a lot of grass, you will see all of them will just stop there. Why? Because there's grass. There comes a time that you don't have grass anymore. Or you are young, you are started, you are busy shouting, you are not, people are not benefiting consistently or constantly, or your word is not fresh. They are bound to God, not to you. They want to hear the word of God. There are people that are going through tremendous issues and your ministry is not solving them. They are bound to God. And they hear a voice say, I have solution for you at Christ Ambassador's Church in Kempton Park. They will move. So remember, they are not bound to you, but they are bound to God. Number four, never be bitter with anyone that leaves. Mm. Never be bitter because you will, you will kill your ministry with, by anger and strife and offense. You will be so bitter, you will kill your ministry. Remember, when you realize that they come for a reason for a season and a lifetime, never be bitter with anyone. Some people don't talk to people that leave their church. Some people, when you ask them in our church, now people come in here for me to pray for them, and they left three years ago. When they hit problem, they say, we know where to go to. Sometimes you see them in the church, they talked about you, they've gossiped you, they say, I will never. I saw one yesterday in the church, one lady, that cost everybody here and left. I saw her yesterday. You know, she was sitting down taking communion. <laughs> taking communion with us. 
you feel like taking the communion away from her. Go and eat your own communion where you're coming from. You know, but you can never be bitter with anyone that leaves. Please, I beg of you. You know, never, never, ever be bitter. Anyone that comes to you and leaves you, allow the person to go with a clean heart. You know, remembering that uh, uh, everybody has a choice. Everybody has a right. Amen. Okay, let me share a secret. Number five, this is important to you. Not without, without anger. Every time you, ha you hear that someone has left, go to God in prayer and sow the person as a seed. <laughs> I'm teaching you secrets of how to handle when people leave you. And when, when you sow that person, don't expect they will come back home. But sow them as a seed. The Bible says, uh, if you sow, you reap how many fold? Hundredfold. No, it's, it's, it's a mystery. So when you hear Angelina has left, and you hear it, hey, Angelina has been doing this, Angelina has talked, Angelina has left, go back to your closet. Say, Father, I love Angelina. I release Angelina. But I sow Angelina as a seed. You can sow anything. If, you, if people say so money, money, it will come back to you. Why can't you sow human being? Did God not sow Jesus? He sow Jesus and reaped a lot of Jesus' now. What you sow, you reap. So when somebody leaves without bitterness and anger, say, Father Joshua just left. You know, for green, you know, I don't know, I love Joshua, but the way Joshua left, well, no offense, Father. Make sure in your prayer you sow Joshua. Except the wheat of God falls into the ground, it abided alone. So say if ten live, if ten live, be happy. That ten has left. So you ten times hundred, hundred. You have a thousand. But the problem is that you are not sowing those that leave. So those that leave you, you sow them. Father, I've sown them as a seed. I've sown them. Let them do well. Let them go and progress. Let the Lord bless them. Let them increase. But I sow them because they have gone. I expect a hundredfold. This one will bring me 10. This one will bring me 50. This one will bring me 100. This, so you sow them as a seed. Now, when you sow something, do you get angry that you sowed? You don't get angry that you sowed. So I've sown a lot of people as seeds. And God is bringing me stronger people. God is bringing me better people because of the seed that I've sown. Don't forget, you must sow them uh, as a seed. He said, remember that God has a better plan for your ministry. Uh, there are people you must let go. Sometimes if you don't want to let them go, God will chase them for you. Hear this again. So many times we get angry, we get bitter. I remember one lady, you know, we were all praying for her to leave the church. Why? Because she was a problem. And you couldn't go and tell her to leave. <laughs> she kept staying until one day she got angry. She said, I'm leaving all of us. Say, Amen. Amen. She left. Amen. The lady, the lady left. And we understand. Don't ever forget that. That most times, it is God that increases your ministry. It is God that convicts people to come. We had a young man yesterday. He said, I was driving. I told God I need to come to Shabbat. God told him. Remember, on the Sunday, the man just drove in and parked the car and just came and sat at the back. It is God that pulls people into your ministry. It is God that brings people. Sometimes people see me in a dream. People here and they begin to drive down. Only God brings people to ministry. So never forget, remember that God has a better plan. So most times when some people are living, they must go. I remember my favorite story is the story of jo Jonah. Jonah in the, in the boat. Remember Jonah was a pastor. Big evangelist. Great man of God. God spoke to him like he's speaking to Billy Graham. You know? And um, But one day he got up and said, I am the problem. I am the problem. Throw me into the water that you might save your life. Great scripture. Say, throw me. If you don't throw me in there, this whole boat will capsize. So there are people that God will throw into the water. God must let them go. If not, the ship will sink. Amen? Let God look after them where they go to. And thank God, God is, is a good God. He sent a fish to look after Jonah. So there are people you must let go because or else you, you'll be so hot or else you'll be so bitter because you've, been, you've not allowed them to go. Let them go that God will bring others. Some will not 
most will not come until people go. Jesus, Jesus, almighty Jesus, said to his disciples, it is important that I go. Imagine. Who wouldn't want Jesus to be around? He said, it is, it is essential that I leave. He said, if I don't go, the Holy Ghost will not come. If I don't go. So, so many times, if some people don't leave, literally the Holy Ghost will not come. <laughs> Amen. The Holy Ghost will not come. So, some must go. Some must. It's because some people have problems. You put them in some department, they, they scatter everywhere. They want to be seen. You, you correct them, they cause problems. Once people see them, everybody's scared. Because they, they think they are right. They think they, they deserve to be there. They think when those kind of people come, God will just say, let me look for how to kick out this person. And the person that God is kicking out, you want to bring in? No, 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 no. You know, have you found out that most times when you go to the grocery shop, all you give to them is money and they give you a package. Most of the thing they give to you in size is bigger than the money you give. Have you noticed? Yeah. You want to go and buy a shoe, take it. You can't feel 300 rand. It's small. When you give it, they give you a big shoe. <laughs> Why? That 300 rand needed to go for that shoe to come. So sometimes that's how it is in ministry. What we're discussing today is dealing with pastoral rejection. The pastor's rejection. So so many people walk out on you Remember that God has a better plan. Amen. And finally, I said, remember the ministry belongs to God and it's not yours. The ministry belongs to God and it's not yours. So many times, the pain, yes, you, you, you serve. So many times you give all, but still, he says, I will build my church. It is his church. All you are is a servant and a steward. It is not your church. So your anger, your bitterness, and your, your strife, like it's your personal property, is not helping you. You know, yes, you have to be emotionally tied to it, you manage physically everything, because you, you put your blood and your sweat, you know, but it is not your property. So don't behave and act as if the ministry is your property. So when things happen, what you need to do is go back to the owner of the business. Go back and say, Lord, even Jesus, if you go to uh, John chapter 17, when Jesus was praying, he said, Father, the ones that you gave to me, I have kept. Only this one, <laughs> that's Judas. But he was give, going back, you see, he was, he remember he called the 12 disciples. Remember he raised the 12 disciples. But when he went back to prayer, he said to God, the one that you gave to me, the one, so the disciples were given to him by the Father. He said, oh, the ones who gave to me have not lost anyone but this uh, child of perdition. So Jesus was saying, you gave me a ministry, and the ministry you gave to me has, uh, 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 I'm coming back to give you a report. So the ministry, the ministry is not yours. The ministry is not yours. The ministry belongs to God. The ministry belongs to God. Because the ministry belongs to God, God owns the ministry. Therefore, do not kill yourself. Do not get bitter over what is not yours. Do not get angry over what is not yours. If you are feeling bad or something that you don't like happened, go back to God and give a report. Give a report. Some people are living, Lord, what is happening? People are backbiting against your work. What is happening? Please help me here. Please help the ministry there. Uh, in doing that, God begins to fight for you. God begins to fight for you. Finally, hear this now. What I'm going to say will shock you. What I'm going to say will shock you. Never defend yourself. My goodness. Never defend yourself yourself so many pastors want to re want to reply to accusation you want to reply to rumors you want to reply to what they are saying you want to reply to what you had they said they gossip about you somebody that left you 
uh, they were talking somewhere in the in the in the mama put okay we call the restaurant they were talking in the shop somewhere they met in a, a, a elisa's house and they are discussing you 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 want to know hey what did they say what are they this? you will die <laughs> no what they're saying i did not do don't if you are not guilty don't defend yourself this is what the holy spirit told me years ago he said this to me if you fight for yourself I will stop fighting for you. If you fight for yourself, I will stop fighting for you. You don't defend yourself. When people leave, hey, look at what we had that this sister left. Say, eh, I leave it in the hands of God. Hey, see what they are saying about you? Eh, I leave it in the hand of God. Hear this? God will vindicate you. God, eh, God will vindicate you. Let them talk in Tembisa or in Johannesburg or in Nigeria. Let them say things because and most times the rumors and the gossips that people spread is free advert for you. So many people did not know me until they started talking about me in the street. Eh, is that what is happening? Is that what he did? One day that person will get have problem. He will say, "Nah, they mentioned that uh, this man. We're not sure. Somebody he did it sound like this. Somebody that had headache. People say it's fake. It's fake. That kind of thing is fake. One day so that person will get a headache. He say, "Well, they say it's fake, but this headache is killing me. Let me go and see whether this man can help me with the headache." And the person comes to the church, the same hand, boom. God has added one to you. So don't defend yourself. And I want to advise you. I want to plead with you. What God has called you to do is noble. And if God has called you, he will fight your cause. If God has called you, he will defend you. If God has called you, he will be there for you. Do be encouraged. Be encouraged. You are a pastor, a minister after God's heart. And God is a rewarder. He will never forget your work, whatever you've been doing for his kingdom. And when he starts rewarding you, all the gainsayers will be quiet. They will shut up. Imagine all those that, that crucified Jesus. The Bible says all eyes will see him. <laughs> what will they be saying? The man that you crucify, you come to find out that he's the son of the Most High God. Some of us, they've criticized. Some of you, they will criticize. And one day, they will see us in heaven and they will apologize to us. And those that did not make heaven will remind them where they are. Say, you didn't make it, Baba. I'm here. Good luck where you are. So be strong. May God give you strength. Keep doing the work of God. Keep pushing. God has your back. God will support you. God will be there for you. Believe you me, he will be there for you. May God bless you. Let me pray for you. I want to pray for you, pastor, evangelist, minister, member, whoever you are that has gone through rejection, that has gone through this kind of victimization, gossips, or people have abandoned you, people that you've loved have walked out on you, people have stabbed you with two knives, and as they're stabbing with two knives, they're doing their hands like this to get an extra knife to put back in your back. I want you to know that God will reward your effort. God knows you are there. God knows what you are going through, and he's not a man. He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray for my brother, I pray for my sister, that great man of God, that woman of God that is discouraged, that is under tremendous pressure, that is going through issues that she or he thinks that they will not come out from. You're a merciful God. I pray that you have mercy on them. Encourage them. Let them know that you call them. Let them be encouraged. Father, help them. Increase them. Bless them. Supply their needs. Let them be encouraged in one fact that God called them into ministry, that their lives, you know, will be a testimony and a testament that you're still a good God. Thank you for hearing. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, my name is Dr. Ida Peterson. We want to hear from you. Amen. If this program has been a blessing to you, encourage me to <laughs> and send us an email or send us a, a WhatsApp message. Our email address is on the screen there, Pastor Ida 
at gmail.com. We have a WhatsApp number there, uh, 79 Send us a message and let us uh, uh, be encouraged the way we are encouraged. May God bless you. Until next time, this is Ministerial Ethics. God bless you.